Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me here at Amuse. I'm Amy Elliott, and uh, despite my pixelated photo, um, I welcome you to take pictures of me. You can uh, tweet at me, reach out. This is my real uh, contact information. I'm here to talk about uh, how to build trust with user experience design. And I am an American who is based in Berlin, Germany, where I work for Simply Secure. We are a non-governmental organization, a nonprofit that focuses on security and privacy and ethics. And uh, there are several different audiences for that work. Um, but all of you here in this audience, in your role as a professional coming to an event like this to get educated, are in our audience. So I work for you. And I look forward to your questions and keeping the conversation going um, afterwards if you still have ideas that aren't addressed. So uh, the, one, the one slide, the one summary, the, the point of this, is, of my talk, is, is here. So first of all, I can barely see in the audience, but TLS certificates, anyone, anyone? Just me, OK. So um, the point of this talk is that you do not need to be a cryptographer or a lawyer uh, to work in security. I'm going to talk you through how and why these are pressing social problems. Security and poor internet security is a pressing social problem that requires input from everyone. And that includes UX designers. So approaching the problem of security from a UX point of view, uh, there are kind of three points to this talk, three sections that I would like to uh, talk you through. Um, the first is just understanding the risk to users. So um, in security speak, we talk about what's your threat model? Who are you worried about having your data? And generally speaking, there are kind of four main um, groups of, of adversaries that people are concerned about. And which one of these you're worried about really depends on the context. So right now, there's um, kind of only general agreement on the hacker point, that hackers are bad and that thieves should not be able to steal your money. That's a pretty uncontroversial point. But when we look at the security industry, the incentives are pretty misaligned. And um, for example, things like um, insurance policies are contributing to the rise of ransomware because it's easier and cheaper for companies to buy this kind of insurance and just pay it out. And um, when thieves and scammers are paid, they're incentivized to keep going. That's their business model. Um, so moving on to governments and companies, this is an illustration um, for uh, a video that explains how the Tor browser works that was uh, done by uh, Kajart Studio in Canada. And even without being able to read the details of these companies or place exactly who these people are, you can see that they're kind of two, uh, two main adversaries. I spent most of my career in Silicon Valley um, working as a consultant for big tech. And in Silicon Valley, most people um, are skeptical about the government and have strong positive feelings about the Googles and Facebooks and Amazons of the world and their ability to kind of protect people from governmental overreach. Now I live in Berlin, Germany, which is completely the opposite. And in general, in Germany, and particularly in Berlin, people have strong positive feelings about the government and how the government is going to protect people against overreach by these 
Silicon Valley corporations that are part of this you know, kind of capitalist system extracting data. Now, in the American context, there's a misconception that this all kind of started happening um, after um, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States in 2016. And that's really just not true. Um, this is an example of something that was up um, on TechCrunch talking about Twitter um, you know, back in 2014 under the Obama presidency and Twitter taking very seriously uh, what it sees as part of its mission as pushing back um, against the United States government. So if you choose to follow American news, there are a number of reasons why following the US news might not be something that you want to give more attention to. But this kind of context may be helpful in, in making sense of some of the conversations around um, specifically the US government and companies like YouTube and Twitter. So um, switching away from governments, um, let's talk about smart cities for a minute. Smart cities, this is you know, lovely San Francisco where um, I spent about 20 years, these smart cities make all these promises about how they can improve our quality of life, protect the planet, lead to economic inclusion. But one of the side effects of that is um, when you're connecting, you're collecting. And uh, big data is watching you. In many smart cities, it's not always clear who has the data, or access to data, or what the data is. There are often mixes of these public and private partnerships around um, building infrastructure. And one way that this works is private companies will agree to pay to put actual um, you know, objects on the street. And the reason they're doing this is not because they are um, interested in civic improvement. It's because they're planning on monetizing the data that they get from people walking through the city to pay for their investment. So um, another San Francisco example, um, one of the pressing social issues in the United States right now is gun violence. So um, uh, shootings are a fact, um, an unfortunate fact of life in the United States um, for many people. And San Francisco is one of the cities that has a system um, called a uh, shot spotter. Shot spotter is an array of microphones around the city that listens for gunshots and then calls the police. Seems like a relatively straightforward value proposition around um, you know, potentially saving lives from gun violence, but there are a lot of questions because it's not clear what areas have these microphone arrays. It's not clear what they're uh, collecting. Um, their website is a little vague. It says only frequencies associated with guns. But um, I think a number of people would feel uncomfortable knowing that when they're standing on a street, there are microphones over them sending the information to a private company who then decides to notify the government. So I think we can all imagine um, some potentially really radically negative consequences of that way of working. Um, so a, a different kind of take or example from the smart city space, Mobike. Um, Berlin, like many European cities, I've seen some of the scooters even here, um, has a number of different bike sharing uh, applications and bikes. They all have their different colors. So Mobike is one of them. And if you go into the um, Google Play Store for Android, you can see what kinds of data uh, Mobike is collecting about you. Now, people who are familiar with these apps are unsurprised that they're tracking their location and that they're accessing the camera. The way that they work is you use your camera to scan a barcode. And of course, the bike company needs to or deserves to know where their property is, so they follow you as you ride the bike around the city. But if you actually look at these terms, there are some surprises in there. Um, you know, why exactly does it need to know your shortcuts, your home screen, keep your phone from sleeping? You know, there may be really good software development reasons for this, but it's really not disclosed. And this points to kind of a bigger, um, a bigger problem. So 
By using Mobike, you agree to these um, 33 pages. I just screenshotted these on my phone um, of the terms and conditions. So T's and C's is kind of an acronym for terms and conditions. But in English, it has the benefit of also sounding like T's and C's, which is really what's happening um, with this data. So some of the surprises in here are that you're not allowed to uh, make defamatory uh, comments or uh, pornographic images um, while using the service. And what does that mean? Like, no sexting while you're using a mobike? And who determines what's illegal or pornographic? Uh, you know, this company is based in China. And you know, being careful to avoid kind of sweeping racism um, against you know, com companies in other countries, I think there's some valid questions about who does the internet belong to and which cultural norms and legal frameworks should govern it. So it's completely unrealistic to imagine that anyone is reading these things. This is an art installation from Dima Yarovinsky, and um, these are the terms and conditions of a number of popular internet apps, and I believe that the purple is Instagram. So I'll just let you all imagine what that's about. But in order to shift from this very abstract legal conversation to something that's more targeted to UX, Let's just think about what you get on the screen. The experience of renting one of these bikes is it's designed to be seamless. It's pretty magical. You can walk up to any of these things on the street, whip out your phone, download an app, put in some super basic data, and you're off and running. And the way in which that works is there's this giant thumb-wide button that just begs to be clicked. But one thing that's really hard to keep track of is that by clicking that button, you agree that any time you're using Mobike, you agree to their updated terms and conditions, even though you don't actually know what they are or when they change. So if you contrast the, the real ease of getting onboarded and going, it's clear that this team has worked really hard to get you from non-user to on this bike quickly. But one of the side effects is all of this legal complexity just gets swept away. And I don't want to particularly um, shame or criticize Mobike specifically. I think that it makes sense for everyone, no matter what their products are, to ask questions about what data they're collecting. Um, this is a series of screenshots from shopping and loyalty apps um, that were popular a couple of years ago um, in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area all kind of related to getting discounts on cups of coffee. And um, it's pretty common that these apps want incredibly personal information. They want to track your location. They want to know where you go. They want to know as much details as they can to build a robust profile of you. And so what happens is people end up giving away data just for the price of a cup of coffee. This is some field work I did in New York. And um, the young woman in this picture used this uh, DD Perks app. You see the sign over her shoulder. That's for Dunkin' Donuts. And it's basically a way to get uh, cheaper free coffee um, through the app. And there's a bunch of kind of interesting things that were in the app at the time, including the ability to send a friend a free donut on their birthday. Sounds like a reasonable, kind of generous, loyalty-building thing to do. But what ends up happening is they have contacts in your address book, their birthdays, and their specific locations so that they can know exactly which Dunkin' Donuts to send the donut to. And uh, I don't believe that the people who did this app are like evil geniuses, but they've collected some really rich, potentially dangerous, and volatile um, information. And I think it's worth questioning um, what are the consequences, the unintended consequences that are reasonably foreseeable about the risks of having that kind of data. Um, and moving kind of out of the app space more deeply into 
the Internet of Things. This is an, an example um, from a few years ago um, that's still for sale now um, on Amazon.de. Um, They're selling it in Germany. It's called the iKettle. And the iKettle is one of a number of internet appliances that lets you um, do things around your home in the space of automation. And what this does is it lets you boil water using your phone. So um, what we see on the right side of the screen is a map of the city of London. People in London are really into tea, so it makes sense that they would have this, um, these eye kettles. And the choices that the designers made, the development team of the eye kettle product, included some pretty um, egregious lapses in um, security. So in order for this thing to work, people put it on their Wi-Fi network. And it's trivially easy to expose who has one of these eye kettles on a map. And I haven't been following this very closely, but as far as I understand, now um, nearly four years later, this issue remains. Um, this map was done by uh, the register.com, um, a UK newspaper. But what you see here is actually potentially pretty shocking. If one of those uh, red arrows is you, someone, for example, a thief, knows that you um, have so much money that you have a smartphone, and you're willing to um, pay money to, for something that costs 135 euros, 135 euros to boil water. So you're probably rich. And you also don't understand security. So what this means is by just purchasing one of these, you can show up on a map as rich and stupid. And probably some people are interested in this information to know what other kinds of devices might you have um, that they could resell if they chose to break in. And the IoT example is an interesting kind of bridge to um, the uh, last group of actors um, in the threat model space, and that's stalkers. So domestic violence is a pressing social problem globally, affecting you know, people of, um, you know, across broad spectrums of society, all races, classes, all these kinds of things. And um, one of the kind of more shocking things that's out on the internet is this um, spyware app called Hello Spy. And uh, this has been discussed in detail in some of the um, really, really great talks um, online about um, the Republica conference. And basically, the premise is either to control your children or your um, you know, domestic partner or possibly your employees. You can intercept every message, every website, every photo, every everything on people's phones. This is uh, not legal, but they're not really making much of an effort to hide. And in the context of, of these kinds of things, it's pretty easy to say, well, don't, don't be stupid. Like, don't buy a 135 euro kettle. Don't let someone put spyware on your phone. But what's really missing here is the much greater sense that this is not appropriate to treat as like an individual decision. Like one individual can't opt out of this because if you have, for example, a router in your home, if you or someone in your apartment is maintaining a Wi-Fi network, you are contributing to the infrastructure that can form these botnets. And these botnets can all band together to form these distributed denial of service attacks that can take pieces of the internet offline at will. So what that means is if there's any part of the internet that you like, for example, to get information about political candidates to vote in order to promote your business, in order to do anything, you are vulnerable to the infrastructure of the internet working. I saw today that in the US, there is a uh, currently in the news sextortion um, botnet, which is sending out 30,000 emails an hour, um, just saying, hello, email address. I know this is one of your passwords. I've infected your computer. 
I've taken all the photos and videos. By the way, I'm spying on you through your uh, webcam. I've uh, found images of you having sex, and I'm going to send them to everyone in your contacts list unless you uh, pay me. And the reason which that can work at that scale is because of things like the monitors, the, uh, the baby monitors, the Wi-Fi routers, the webcams of the world that are unattended. It's not a case of an individual not buying a toaster or a tea kettle and opting out. It's a social problem that affects everyone. And because these, these threats of security and privacy and ethics affect everyone, there's a huge need for leadership from within the UX community. So what I'd like to do is, is switch gears and talk about um, some opportunities for design leadership in the space. Coming back to that kind of main point that you don't have to be a cryptographer or um, a, a very, very uh, you know, technical code writer in order to contribute, I'm going to share some examples about how a range of UX skills, including things like visual design and copywriting, can contribute to uh, improving the state of security. So I'd like to start with one example. I think that in general, the entire field of internet security can have a kind of negative reputation. Much of the imagery um, about it is very militaristic. Cyber threat down, attack, secure your borders. And that kind of language, if you just look at the, the general colors, the tone of um, the visual design of a number of security products, it's often um, fairly kind of hacker, lots of black, dark, fluorescent green kind of gamer vocabulary. And those kinds of cues signal to a, a swath of people that this product or this field isn't really for them. So I would like to call out um, Canadian um, VPN provider TunnelBear. VPN is a virtual private network that offers some security benefits for people that want to do stuff on the internet. And what I like about this is it really puts forward that it's caring for you. This product is helping you in some way more than it is like punching or harming your, your enemies. And I think these choices in explaining the benefits of the product, this cute visualization, the bear with its little paw, browse privately, you know, chewing through the cable, all of this very sweet, cute, nurturing kind of imagery really sets a very different set of expectations about what this product is. And I think that there are some challenges right now to figuring out how to get more people involved in this conversation and sending the message that you don't have to be a lawyer, a cryptographer, or a cyber security expert to participate in this. So um, this is an example that I think is pretty provocative in terms of what it could tell us as end users about how the internet works. This is probably a familiar set of screens to most people here. They are screenshots taken um, a few years ago on an iPhone um, in the iMessage um, application. Just using basic color and a few characters, you get a bunch of, of pretty interesting information about who you're messaging with. Green bubbles are Android users or non-iPhone users, probably Android. Blue bubbles are other iPhone users. And using these very kind of simple bits of characters, read and delivered, you can understand some things about the state of your message partner's phone. And this works all around the world on Wi-Fi. I can be in Germany on telecom. I could be in the US on Verizon, AT&T. Doesn't matter, Samsung, all the different hardware, it just works. Similarly, um, at the far right, you see the WhatsApp screen, where that messaging platform has an option for a convention in groups to use check marks for red receipts. And I think this is a very, very powerful example of a minimal design choice that convey, conveys important information. And more than that, it changes behavior. So I know that these check marks in WhatsApp have very much changed my behavior. 
I'm in a number of groups, and when I get these messages from WhatsApp and they're on my home screen, and I'm in one of these groups that does the check marks for red receipts, I'm very careful to not touch my phone. And I don't touch my phone because I don't want that check by my name, because then I'm being, being rude and slow and not responding, and I, I don't want to be like that person that just sits there with like the dot, 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 and then the dot, dot, dots go away, and then you kind of ghost out and never see anyone again. So thinking about that, that is some really elegant UX, and it's so subtle. This is completely different than meeting a functional requirement. So for example, some company could say, all our products will issue red receipts. Or um, some government could say, every application in our country must issue red receipts. But if the way that you get there is by doing some really complex flow, like long press on the sender's name to open the message menu, and then you know, scroll down to receipt, and then it says message ID 116 equals 0 or message ID 116 equals 1. So it's just a verbal, hypothetical example of a really bad way to convey that same information. Has this been read? Has it been opened? And when? And I think that if we take the successes of these very simple check marks, the visual vocabulary, and the way in which they interact, we could think about expanding that to a whole other range of stuff. How would red receipts work for smart cities? How would red receipts work for voice interfaces? How would we know if our Amazon Alexa, if our car, if our all these other pieces of infrastructure have actually received our message? These are the kinds of challenges that UX designers need to start working on in order to convey more clearly how these things work. So um, this is a, an example about ways in which of, of Visual style guide doing something as simple as consistent colors can actually help um, build trust in your brand because people that see it will understand what it is. The uh, Facebook and, and Twitter images you see here are uh, spam. They're fake. The colors are slightly wrong. A not particularly careful spammer probably used something like an eyedropper tool or just guessed close enough to make it look OK. The way in which those attacks work fits 30,000 messages an hour a day. All they need is to get lucky a couple of times. They don't have to be that careful. They're just trying to kind of incrementally outrun the next people. In contrast, if you look at this dark green, this Pantone dark green, and the example of the phone and the cup, we probably all know what's in that cup. What kind of drink, what kind of product is in that green cup? It's Starbucks. It has to be Starbucks. On all these different continents with all these different vendors and suppliers and paper and cup and wax and printing and film, they really, really safeguard that green, and they own that color. It's not particularly difficult to do this, but it is important to be consistent. And the, the colors that you see at the bottom um, are from Simply Secure's own um, style guide around you know, what exactly are the RGB values and the hex values for our colors. And even you know, really kind of big, robust software companies can still struggle with this. I recently learned that the design team at Slack has gone through a really big effort at winnowing down the number of colors to a few, and almost nobody noticed the change. It's just one of those things that in a startup environment when the product's growing really quickly, sometimes people are using eyedroppers or just guessing, or there are these kind of subtle things that seem not quite right. So style guides aren't only um, colors. They can also be words. And I think that. Copywriting is also an important part of getting more people informed, educated, and eager to participate in conversations about security and privacy and ethics. So this is an example of something around this writer's AQ, HQ privacy policy that 
The text isn't too small for you to read. There's some funny little things in there. Celebrate your achievement with a gold star. And um, you know, a number of companies have been pretty intentional about this. I know the um, MailChimp writing style guides have gotten a lot of attention, and they say things like, we don't use the words rock star and ninja unless we mean like an actual rock star or like an actual ninja. And that, that's just them being really kind of clear on what their values are. And these words matter, and, and they can help help people understand who and what they're dealing with. And in this final section of the talk on practical advice, I'm going to try to connect how things like this written style guide can help keep your users safe. So one of the things that I've talked about with scammers is something like a phishing attack. So phishing is trying to get information from someone under false uh, premises, like something like a credit card or a password or a name by pretending that you're trustworthy. And you know, one way in which this could happen is if you think about in um, the e-commerce ecosystem, there are a number of different platforms that all interact, sometimes in unpredictable ways. So these are some fake examples of domain uh, URLs uh, for a company that I made up that might be in Berlin called Streetwear, uh, Berlin Streetwear. And one of the things that's happening in the very top is there's an extra L in the Silicon Alley. So if someone is masquerading the website, that could lead you somewhere totally else. There are also some questions on the content strategy side about um, how to handle these, these integrations. And for the, the, the third party, you know, easy pay, should it be berlinstreetwear.com slash easy pay or easypay.com slash berlinstreetwear? Um, I don't know what the right answer is. But we've spent so much energy collectively trying to separate people from their money through UX by making it really easy to seamlessly have all these experiences. It's time to rethink a little bit how to help people understand where these boundaries are. The state of the art right now, especially in uh, places like Europe, where the, the GDPR data protection regulations are happening, it's pretty grim. There's a lot of these kind of um, uh, menu bar or banners at the top that you're supposed to X out of or say OK to, and no one's reading them. But I think that there is a design opportunity here to think about how these pieces of the internet interoperate. And finally, um, in the security field, there's still some blameable users. So for example, from a security point of view, people are told never to click on suspicious links. But just being part of the modern economy means you probably have an email box that's probably full of links like this thing at the bottom from the list manager. And we need to get smarter and more sophisticated rather than scolding people not to click on things and actually educating what the consequences of what happens when you send that click. Who gets it? How are they benefiting? Um, so this is a little bit of the dystopian, uh, scary part of this talk. Dangerous URLs are really hard to detect on mobile. What we see here are two different screens. Um, sorry, the same screen, two different views of something impersonating PayPal. They've come up with something in the URL bar that looks about right until you click on it. And at the right, it's not managemyaccount.paypal.com. It's actually going to a completely other website. That's a really, really hard attack to defend against. Someone really put some effort into that. And I don't know what the answer is. But the answer can't be everyone is supposed to click on this tiny little URL bar in mobile in order to check that this is what's happening. That, that's blaming the user. It's not realistic. App security is hard. There are a lot of challenges in the mobile web um, ecosystem. But we, we need to do better, and UX can help. So, on to how the style guide and the written style guide can work together. I'm personally um, a user, a paid customer, not just a user, of uh, G Suite. So G Suite is the, the current iteration of the constantly evolving churn 
of names for what the Google products are calling themselves. So it's not um, true in my case, since I'm a paid customer, that I'm paying with my data for the benefits of using their products. I'm actually giving them money every month. And I think that it's pretty telling that as someone that's used these products near daily for years, I still have a very difficult time using words to explain what they are. This whole Google Docs and Drive thing, I'm still confusing. I don't know how to say, check the drive. I can Dropbox you something, but I can't drive you something. And th th there's some gaps in my language about how, how I'm able to think about this. And it's confusing about how this works. So one example of uh, Fishers getting into someone's Gmail um, another American political example was during the, during the 2016 US election, one of the senior Democratic Party officials had their email, their Gmail, hacked, in part because someone clicked on a, a, a fake link. And I think there's a real risk to that, even with as much money as Google has and as much power and as much talent, there's still some, some gaps. So what we see here is the, the dead-eyed folder in Chrome. And uh, there's some fun kind of Easter egg gamery things in Chrome. If you have a network connectivity issue, you get this kind of 8-bit um, graphic dinosaur jumping thing. And I know why this looks like this, but it's really very different in tone and feel from these very slick marketing, like you know, Google Cloud, make it work for you built by G Suite. And what that means is that I, as a customer, don't know how Google or Gmail or G Suite or Chrome or Google Drive is supposed to talk to me. I don't know if something is legitimately from them or not, because they can kind of sound like anything. This is where a written style guide, I think, would help. I don't know why they made these design decisions, but I suspect that it has to do with giving teams in a big you know, global behemoth some autonomy. But a consequence of that is it's just really confusing to know if this G Suite Chrome Gmail Drive docs is a, like a hipster gamer hacker or a very chipper, like, get it, girl, build your business with ads kind of company. And if I'm expected to click these links and enter my Gmail details, I feel like I should have a better understanding of who I'm giving them to. So to quickly recap, this talk had three parts about understanding the risk to users, including things like companies, governments, hackers, and uh, stalkers, some ideas about design leadership, including things like um, how red receipts could be an inspiration for other forms of data collection in the smart cities and beyond, and some practical advice about how things like style guides, written and visual, can help build trust. And the point of all of this is to move the security conversation, the cybersecurity, the privacy conversation, away from this very negative shaming, no, you shall not click these links, and into something that's more positive and yes, and closer to the kind of tone that this Tunnel Bear VPN uses to convey a sense of benefits, something that someone wants other than avoiding harm. So um, to conclude, I started by saying, I work for you, and that's really true. Um, on our Simply Secure website, we have a knowledge base with a bunch of different kind of resources and articles on a number of these topics, including stuff on artificial intelligence and getting going on security. If you're coming from a more technical side, you can also build some skills in branding. If you go there and there's something you're expecting and it's not there, please let me or one of my colleagues know, because you're the audience that we're trying to help pull this into your professional practice. And we want to know what your priorities are. So with that, I will stop. And I will say, again, here is our, uh, here's my contact information. Simply Secure operates a Slack that talks about uh, UX design and ethics and security issues. You're welcome to join. And uh, with that, I will uh, step back and uh, wait to see what your questions are. Thank you.
Hi, Amy. Hi. First question, as an expert in the field, what precautions do you take personally to protect yourself online? My number one tip is use a password manager. Use a password manager. I use OnePass, and uh, there are a number of good ones out there. Um, some of password managers are being built you know, into different browsers, but you really just don't you know, if you think that you're being really tricky because you're putting an exclamation point on the end of your password, everyone is putting an exclamation point on the end of their password, OK? The people that are sending out these high volume things are onto you. Get a password manager. That is the number one tip. And with a password manager, uh, you have an option, I guess, to let that system generate a password. That's a good idea. Uh -huh. Longer is always better. And you know what? If the password manager fills it in for you, there's nothing to type. And it, um, I've been really happy with one password. It's just once I get logged into my vault, I can, I can get that stuff exactly where it needs to be. None of this like tiny little um, cap block shift thing to get the special characters. Let's get a password manager. Uh, related question, yeah. what's your take on laptop camera? covers? Um, I think it's a reasonable thing to cover up your camera. I mean, it's this ongoing kind of battle where I think one thing to do is just give yourself peace of mind. I also frankly think that one benefit of these laptop camera covers is signaling that you're aware of these issues. And I think it's important mm. to signal that. And also, you're going to know that nobody is um, you know, activating your camera. I've seen reports. I've never met the man or seen his laptop, but that Mark Zuckerberg has a super secure laptop with that actually like completely removed um, as a high value target. And I think getting a laptop slide thing is a reasonable step. Another very popular question. Uh, we'd like to hear your take on the interaction design around GDPR, oh the you know, security and cookie <laughs> notifications and disclaimers. There's got to be a better way, no? It, there, yes, there really does have to be a better way. And as an optimistic American uh, working in this field, I was really, really looking forward to GDPR being rolled out and having the, the conversation around data collection radically change. And it just kind of didn't. And um, the policy things happening behind the scenes and strategic litigation are going really quite slowly. But there is an urgent need to do better than this ridiculous like X out of text that no one's reading. These issues matter. If you use the internet for literally anything, we have to do a better job of securing the internet and making visible these conversations about who has your data. So get on it. You don't need to be a cryptographer to make a contribution in security. Brand, visual design, everybody, get on it. Fix it. It's broken. Sort of a related question. <laughs> Any tips for, uh, oh my gosh, all the questions just gone. Uh, I remember the question. Oh, okay. Any, any tips? <laughs> I was like, whoa. Uh, any tips for working with attorneys as part of a design team? That is a great question. I personally have not had a lot of experience working with attorneys. And I think that something that confused me a little bit as a UX designer is some of the conversation around privacy by design is more lawyer-led than user experience designer-led. And what that means is design is used in a more legal sense, like, you know, I've got designs on this. It's more like bullets that describe uh, behavior, how features might work, than um, actual visual decisions. So, I mean, I support figuring out ways to partner with a broad spectrum of people. And you know, if you can get a lawyer or an attorney on your design team, you know, do it. It's a, it's a tough problem. Everyone's got to do their share. Attorneys, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amy.